Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the center. We've had a great introduction to a world of true disruption and VUCA. Uh, General Votel's remarks highlighted many of those points that we talked about yesterday about operating in that volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment. We're uh, very happy that he has time to join us again for this session, which will now examine, tie together some of the things from this morning with an examination of future disruption and how advanced information technologies, social media, and other technologies are impacting warfare. The impact of these advanced technologies will span from what we might consider routine peacetime activities through what we'll explore a little bit in this panel called the gray zone to high impact conventional war. Our panel of experts has some great insights on this. So joining General Votel are Dr. Brandon Vellerano and Dr. Frank Hoffman. Uh, here are the speakers from, my, from your right to my left. Uh, General Votel needs little more introduction from this morning, uh, but in addition to his service in the military, he's also a scholar in his own rights. He's jointly authored several articles on how groups like ISIL use social media as a strategic tool to recruit, motivate, and sustain their followers through carefully crafted emotive narratives, an issue that we'll explore in this panel. Uh, in the center, Dr. Brandon Vellerano is the Bren Chair of Military Innovation at the Marine Corps University. He also serves as Senior Advisor for the Cyber Solarium Commission and a Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute. Dr. Vellerano has published multiple books and articles, and he has provided testimony on cyber conflict in front of both the United States Senate and the Parliament of the United Kingdom. His ongoing research explores conflict escalation, big data in cybersecurity, the cyber behavior of revisionist actors, and the repression in cyberspace. Dr. Frank Hoffman is a distinguished research fellow at the National Defense University in Washington, DC. His research portfolio includes US grand strategy, defense strategy, defense economics, and military innovation. He is a retired US Marine Corps officer, an infantryman, and a former Pentagon analyst and an award-winning author. He has served on a variety of national security commissions, including several defense science boards, as well as the US National Security Commission for the 21st century. During 2017, Dr. Hoffman served as a special assistant for strategic matters to the Secretary of Defense and served on the National Defense Strategy Task Force. Over the, last, over the past two decades, Dr. Hoffman has testified to Congress regularly and lectured extensively in the United States and overseas. So the format for this morning's panel is going to be somewhat of a moderated interview. I'll start out with a question for each panelist to get them to talk about one of the major issues that this panel will address. And then uh, as you have questions, same rules of engagement, please come to the sides and wait for me to recognize and I'll integrate your questions into the discussion. But I wanna, so I wanna lead off with Dr. Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman, you've written extensively on a number of issues that are interrelated here about the spectrum of warfare, about the so-called gray zone, and about what you see as the emerging seventh military revolution. So could you kind of give us a flavor for 
how this spectrum of warfare is evolving and how you see technology affecting it. Thank you, thank you sir, and thanks for the invitation to be here. I've gotten to be at a point in life where uh, knocking things off the bucket list at this age is important, so uh, coming to Lexington and speaking at VMI has always been on my bucket list. Appreciate the invitation, the honor of being here, and also the honor of being on stage with, uh, with these experts, particularly General Votel, who I've known indirectly for a long time as one of our most innovative officers at the strategic operational and, and the tactical level. Uh, but with respect to this question, I think uh, there is major disruptions going on, but I think our most important disruption is our mindset about how we think about what war is and what war is not. And I think that's what's going to cause the most disruption in the future. Could I have my slides, please? And I do agree with the work that General Votel has done over the last few years in uh, highlighting uh, that part of this mental frame about what we think war is and what our profession is uh, has produced some discognitive or, or disruptive thinking. That we're just not prepared to think about a broadening spectrum of conflict uh, that goes beyond traditional military thinking. And I think that's going to be one of the most disruptive forms of thinking is changing that mindset. We've had some experience over the last 15 years, but we're going to need to be much more. To try to make this relevant for our audience today, I thought I would uh, reach into some current literature. Uh, I hope this has been part of your education. I don't want to piss off the faculty, but there's a lot of George Martin that I would commend to you more than Clausewitz or Mahan if you want to understand geopolitics <laughs> and disruption in the 21st century, whether it's dragons uh, or other forms of technology in your future. But again, this point of expecting war to be linear, symmetrical, and only in the physical domain is part of our, uh, a disruptive breakthrough we need to make through intellectually. Part of this problem, again, has been our philosophy about what war is. George Kennan, in this quote 50-some years ago, has the office next to my old, my current office at the National War College in Roosevelt Hall, said that part of our problem was we, we consider war to be some kind of a sporting event. We separate it from politics and we separate it from, con from context. There is not a black and white sp uh, switch that we're at peace or at war. There's grades of gray in the middle. War is not a field that we designate a place. There is not an agreed goalpost that everybody on both sides is marching through. Not everybody is playing by the same rules. There is not a clock where all sporting contests are 60 minutes in length. Wars can be 15, 17, 18, and 20 years. So they're protracted. Our adversaries like protracted conflict. There are no referees. There isn't anybody throwing yellow flags when you commit a foul. In fact, there's very few rules and the other side doesn't respect the rules. They don't respect the distinction between combatants and non-combatants. The game can often begin in the parking lot. You came for a soccer match, and they came for something else. You came for a knife fight, and they brought guns. We need to, we need to appreciate that. That frame of reference needs to go away. Another frame of reference I think you should displace it with is what I call the Lannister Doctrine. And this wonderful quote again, George Martin is brilliant from time to time is looking at things from the other side's perspective, seeing how he thinks or she thinks in the contest and how they differentiate conflict from war differently than the histories you've read, uh, particularly about our lovely valley campaigns and other traditional conflicts on this continent. Our opponents, particularly the Chinese and the Russians that we spend so much time thinking about, are much more expansive in their thinking, and they're openly critical about the intellectual bandwidth of the American officers. They think we're too narrow, too rigid, too hierarchical, and, and we've defined our military sphere in very, very precise terms uh, in traditional military conflict. Their culture is much more expansive, much more indirect, much more willing to mix legal, psychological and deception into the conflict space and conduct operations over a much longer period of time in a much more indirect manner. The concept of unrestricted warfare and the three warfares. But when you read unrestricted warfare, it is largely not about how they intend to fight. It's largely a critique of the American military officer's intellectual bandwidth. Again, they hadn't read, we haven't read the Lancaster uh, Doctrine. They're interested in cocktails, not in kinetic traditional symmetrical warfare. The Russians are very much the same way. Oops. The Russians are very much the same way. 
They like to pulse in and out of conflicts. They like long conflicts. They like frozen conflicts. They like psychological operations. They like propaganda, disinformation, and distortion and distraction. That's what most of their war is about. If they do get into a military conflict, they'd rather use proxy forces, whether it's the Wagner Group, whether it's the separatists in Donbass, or whether it's using Syria. They want to be more indirect. They do not want to confront us directly, symmetrically, and linearly. Uh, they believe that military and non-military means now can be combined in the battle space to achieve decisive effects, more than just purely military effects. Again, something that the military has, I think, learned over the last 15 years, but is also in danger of losing as this generation of leadership leaves and people misassociate Russia and China as great powers with conventional war. So this is the way I used to look at the conflict spectrum over the last 15 years in arguing with people. And moving from left, uh, from your far right over to the left, thinking about theater war with states that have WMD, that's some of the Cold War and some of our current thinking. Then there's limited conventional war, that's a reality. The Russians and the Chinese do buy advanced military capabilities and we need to be prepared for that. And other medium powers also buy these kind of capabilities. In the middle, there's this notion of hybrid warfare that Mr. Mattis and I designed 15 years ago, uh, mostly because irregular warfare groups were gonna get a lot of lethal capabilities and we thought there was something distinctly different about militias that had missiles or had cyber capabilities or had air defense capabilities or drones. We thought there might be something new that's different than the kind of hearts and minds counterinsurgency and counterterrorism uh, campaigns that are more associated with irregular warfare. But there's a space on the far left, left of the red line of, of war and blood in this gray zone space where there's a lot of competition for influence going on. The dissolution of alliances, the undercutting of influence and capabilities, the shutting down of resources, the shaping of the battle space. We haven't thought a lot about that. General Votel has brought this you know, to the fore in his writings uh, over some period of time, and I think it's an important area. Uh, there's a lot of capability mixes. The far left of this slide represents a lot of traditional legitimate tools of statecraft and influence that we've used normally during peacetime, but we don't think about being strategic assets. But we do foreign assistance, we do security cooperation, we do engagements, we bring 30 or 40 foreign officers into the National War College where I teach for a strategic purpose of having greater interoperability, of extending our influence and gaining friends and deterring adversaries. There's activity on the far right of the slide that we normally associate with Russia or sometimes Chinese that might be considered illegitimate or non-traditional forms of statecraft. And if you're intimately familiar with U.S. activities in the Cold War in Iran or in South America or in Poland in particular in 79 to 82, you know that we've in engaged in some of these activities as well, supporting front organizations, supporting bishops, supporting trade unions, supplying information, countering propaganda. We've maneuvered in that space as well. And to be successful in the 21st century against both great powers and irregular groups, we're going to have to be just as successful at maneuvering and competing in this space as we were in the kinetic space in the past. There's another framework that I've been just working on here lately uh, for my next paper, which I call the four phases of future warfare. That really gets to an expanded conception of the gray zone space that I think is, is fresh and new, or maybe even larger than I think General Botel intended. But this two by two matrix has two dimensions. And the horizontal dimension deals with conventionality, being very unconventional on one side, being very conventional and away games on the far right, and the unconventional being home. And the other dimension is the nature of the actor, major states to states to non-states and to proxy forces. Ended up with this two by two matrix with four different forms of warfare that I think will reflect our future. And starting in the upper right, we understand the state-based conventional away game. That's the past American way of war, conventional war. Still part of the tool set, still part of your training base and education. The next right-hand turn, down there, surrogate warfare, where proxy forces like the Wagner Group, like Hezbollah, like other organizations, are armed, equipped, and motivated by a sponsor like China or Russia to engage against Western interests. That'll be part, I believe, of your future with surrogates. And some authors you know, think that, that surrogates can also be technology. It doesn't have to be a manned organization. It could be entirely cyber, it could be drones, it could be some kind of autonomous weapon system for which attribution and ambiguity is maximized. On the next side over there, the, uh, the, the area that I think uh, Brandon will be talking about, what I call civil disorder. This is a form of conflict 
that social media is just perfect for. Uh, it can be domestically generated, it can be done by a non-state actor, it can be done by a state to create havoc, paralysis, and disruption in our social fabric, in our political system. We've seen some evidence of this domestically, whether it's Charlottesville, whether it's our own elections. We've seen this in Hong Kong going on right now, and you've seen it in Paris, and we've seen it in Brexit in London. Uh, this, this avenue and this vector that social media gets to get into the minds of our civilian populace and governance is significant. The upper left one, I think, is the, m the more interesting one that interests me. It goes back to my work about 15 years ago designing the Department of Homeland Security uh, in 1999, two years before 9-11. This notion of societal warfare, I think, is another great threat that's going to uh, be a source of disruption in the future. This represents a couple of books. Uh, the War with Russia is the conventional book. This uh, Surrogate Warfare is a brand new book that I, I commend for some folks' attention if you're interested in this particular extension. We have both Peter Singer's book, Like War, on the social media. This new book by Stengel on information warfare. Half of, about, half of it's about ISIS, half of it's about Russia. Very useful. I think it extends many of the things that Brandon will be talking about. I won't need to talk about it. This upper left, though, the new rules book by my colleague at work, Sean McFate, uh, is important, I think, for societal warfare. And this is forms of attack on the United <coughs> States itself. This represents my perception, my definition of what societal warfare will be. The application of nonviolent methods to dislocate and paralyze civil society and economic activity of a target state particularly the United States, in order to extract desired political outcomes by coercion. And these will be deliberate attacks, not necessarily cyber, but also computer, also against infrastructure, also against our economy, uh, that try to create a, a form of coercion to get the American people not to be interested in any kind of an engagement or intervention overseas, like another Syria or Iraq or our sustained involvement in Afghanistan. And I think this is a particular area. There's a, couple other researchers overseas talking about this quite a bit. More than just the cyber dimension, more about the homeland. So for those of you who are not going to go into the military after, after your next life, this will may, may, might be a form of warfare that you experience in the gray zone of the future here in the United States against our economy and our way of life. So if I can wrap up, uh, I do realize that at least half the class will be commissioned uh, after you graduate here. You will take an oath. You will join the watch. You will stand on the wall. Uh, you will be able to take a title. You will be able to hold lands. And I can assure you that your next oath will not require celibacy for all your days and nights. <laughs> uh, but it will be, it will be uh, a period of great disruption, some of it mentally, some of it from uh, new technologies. Storms are gathering, and your watch will begin. And whether you're on the economic prosperity side of Marshall's great quote outside, or are you on the peace and security side, I, I believe that uh, you will be stressed, you will be challenged intellectually, physically, and morally. And the only reason I'm confident now, particularly after sitting with several of the students at dinner the other night, that you are prepared and that you will respond with the dedication, the pro professionalism that VMI graduates have always provided. So that'll finish my formal remarks. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Frank. Uh, please. Uh, Hide the slide. Brandon, I'd, I'd like you to pick up on some of those thoughts and uh, bring in some of your own research here into social media and the effects of some of these uh, technologies. And really what uh, Frank has painted for us is a picture of the enemy trying to win without fighting. And we've seen that since the 2016 election with the, uh, was highlighted to us about Russian interference using social media, bots, troll farms, and other deliberate efforts just to divide the country. So could you pick up on that and tell us a little bit about your view on host, how these information technologies are affecting us or how we can leverage them to our own advantage? Great, no problem, thank you. No, happy to be here. Glad to be here on the 10th anniversary of the Leadership and Ethics Conference. Uh, I'm even more happy to get away from D.C. because <laughs> not so much for the political thing, but they lost three games in the World Series. And that's, I, I don't even know how that happened, but uh, just a general malaise on top of a malaise, and it's good <laughs> to be here. So um, 
I'm glad to see many of the cadets here. Uh, I hope to see you in the future at the MCU. And then next 10, 20 years, hopefully I live that long. But uh, I want to see you go through the process. I want to see you go through the education system that we've built up and to see how great the PME system has become. In terms of the IO challenge, though, th there is really no greater challenge in the United States right now than the challenge of information operations and information warfare. It degrades trust. It erodes on the foundations of our security. And the greatest problem is the main fail point is ourselves. We are the weakness. We are the ones that are targeted. So this is a substantial change in how we conceive a conflict. But the reality is, is that cyber and information operations, IO, IW, are just modern forms of political warfare. It's really nothing new in terms of how combat is operating. The only difference is the tools and the speed and who the target is really, the home front. Undermining adversaries from within is the key notion of what political warfare is. And that's the age we've entered in. And it's an interesting age because this is below the threshold of armed conflict. This is something new and different. We're not in a state of declared war. We have no declared adversary. We have no declared real rivals right now. It's tough to argue that Russia's our rival based on capability or even China's our rival based on their own interests. Really, this is about reaching into the homeland, reaching deep into the heart of society and trying to erode trust. And our adversaries have been very successful at that because we cannot deter this. These types of operations are undeterrable because the typical things you need to make deterrence work, like credibility, resolve, response, organize rational structures of command, all these things are gone when you're talking about information operations and modern political warfare. The good news, though, is that these covert tools, because they are covert, are poor methods of signaling. They are poor methods of achieving effect. We don't even know how they actually are achieving effects. There was no poll that said that WikiLeaks influenced the election in such a way that provided decisive victory. There's no clear evidence of just how this effect operation really works. And that's really my main criticism with the Like War book. You know, Forget the fact that none of us use Facebook anymore. I look on Facebook once a week to check my family photos. That's about it at this point. Moving beyond the whole like war issue, the real issue is how do we change the hearts and minds? How does this new form of political warfare have an effect on the target? And that's really something we haven't really come to grips with. We haven't come to grips with this ancient strategy being used with new tools and how these new tools can influence us and how they can kind of make us less secure, mainly because of who we are and how deep they reach into our basic daily lives. You know, our adversaries were having people change names of Pokemon to talk about people who were, you know, killed by police. All these tactics are something we haven't really dealt with, at least since the height of the Cold War. And the reality is that stopping these operations Stopping the impact of social media and information operations really depends on ourselves. That the real most difficult challenge is not the technical challenge. It's really the human solution. What sorts of information are we going to listen to? What sorts of information are we going to trust? What sorts of information are we going to filter out? Are we going to do the research for ourselves? European societies have been very good and very successful at rooting out Russian social information warfare. The reason why is because of high levels of education. It's unclear if we are committed as a society to do the same. But the reality is that one country, Russia, dominates the use of cyber and neighborhood information operations. And I started to code this, do this from a database, metric-based perspective and the reality is that Russia is the one who is operating the most in this space. The problem, though, or the challenge is, is that these are not existential threats. These are not threats to the life and limb of human beings, to the nature of our country. They are more opportunistic attacks. And these sorts of opportunistic attacks, we must respond in a certain way, in a careful way, because we are operating below the threshold of armed conflict. 
We can't go out there and blow things up. We can't go out there and destroy things, but we can disrupt. And we can use deception for our own advantage to turn the tables on the adversary. We can use honey pots. We can use other methods of trying to distract their attention and confuse their efforts. And these are the things we need to do to move forward to, challenge, to meet this challenge. But the reality, as I've said many times, it's as much our problem as anyone else's. Um, I wish I had slides, I'm sorry. I'm gonna go home and develop an information warfare operations slide deck based on Stranger Things. But right now, <laughs> you know, we are in the upside down. Things don't make sense anymore. Things aren't clear anymore. Information is no longer clear. We no longer know who to trust. And it really is something that we need to deal with within ourselves to figure out what information we're going to trust and what information we're going to believe moving forward. Russia is not an all-capable, all-seeing adversary that can destroy the American way of life but they can make it difficult and they can make it more confusing. And they have done that up until this point right now. Great, I'm gonna bring General Botel in for a minute and then we'll come to your, you'll get the first question. So sir, you, you actually gave us a great description of the gray zone and some of these aspects that Frank and Brandon have talked about. And you wrote a couple great articles that talked about, so how does the gray zone and these advanced technologies blend together? And I'm particularly interested in your thoughts on the narrative that groups like ISIS particularly used to create a narrative which then led them to create a virtual caliphate, which I think you argue, and maybe you differ, we can get into that later with Brandon, that actually this narrative did have some effects in terms of recruiting and radicalizing members. So could you talk to us a little bit about this virtual caliphate and what that might mean for operations inside of a gray zone? Thanks, uh, thanks, David. It's great to be with you and, and with these two gentlemen up here today, and I appreciate the opportunity to be at VMI. You know, before we, I address uh, Dave's uh, <clears throat> question, I, I want to go back to this idea of gray zone and, and kind of the articles that we wrote. It was very interesting to me as a SOCOM commander when we started, we watched what happened in Ukraine, and we watched the Little Green Men, and we uh, were kind of schooled, frankly, by, uh, by Russia and their application of, of these techniques uh, very effectively in Ukraine and, and in other places there. And we knew we needed to start talking about this. We needed to get into the intellectual space on this. And uh, I, I recall the very first times we stepped out on this, we referred to it as unconventional warfare, kind of unconventional warfare reports. And the re response we got back from this was over, almost overwhelmingly negative. First of all, people didn't understand uh, unconventional and they didn't, they didn't want any other kind of warfare out there. We had enough stuff going on here. Don't introduce more stuff into this. And then we thought, okay, well, let's talk about political warfare. And I was like, okay, we don't understand that any better. And then we talked about hybrid warfare. And then that was enough of, uh, you know, people go, what the, what are, what are we talking about, hybrid kind of stuff? And then we kind of settled on this gray zone idea. And I, I can recall talking to Secretary Mattis about this, and he says, I hate that term, but it's, but I can't think of one that's better in terms of this. And so we can, So my point up front is that we have to, you know, part of the challenge I think for us is clarifying what we're talking about and making people understand the challenge of what we're dealing with here. I think it's always helpful to go back to this, this, this long message, long telegram that Kennan wrote uh, back in 1947-ish time frame, uh, where he kind of talked about this notion of political warfare and uh, the, the challenge, and he lays out how we, how we will uh, contend with a power, a rising power like the Soviet Union into the future, and largely lays out the strategy that we employ for a long period of time. But he very, he very succinctly addressed this, and then we had a, a uh, you know, an, a national security process and other things that really helped clarify this and make it very, very clear for people. So I think it's really important up front to understand what it is we're dealing with and that we have a continuous education uh, uh, process uh, with this. In, in dealing with ISIS, now to get to Dave's question, you know, we, we struggled with this mightily in the beginning. Uh, you know, this, uh, this movement of, of fighters into this area in the tens of thousands from literally hundreds of different countries around the world 
over 100 different countries around the world, uh, really uh, presented us with a significant challenge. And we had no way of really understanding this, how this use of publicly available information was being used to actually support uh, support uh, this approach, and it took us a while to get ourselves organized uh, for how we how we how we dealt with that. But once we did, then we were then we could begin to effectively address that. And in this case, what we saw ISIS using was, I think, appealing to a narrative out there that resonated with a lot of people in these in uh, in these different companies, people who were disenfranchised, people who felt like they didn't have hope people who felt like their governments weren't representing them uh, well. And they played on this notion that ISIS can help address some of your issues. So when you look at back at this, you look at uh, young men, largely young men that were coming, but there were also a lot of females that came with us. Uh, they were looking for membership in something. ISIS provided that for them. They provided, provided them an organization of which they could be uh, could be a member of. They were looking for economic opportunity. ISIS provided them a job, and and they paid them for what they were doing, and uh, they played on the fact that these uh, disenfranchised young men in different places, um, you know, wanted to have wanted to have what many others had, a family, and so ISIS provided that. They they reported to Raqqa, and they were issued their ISIS wife, and all of a sudden now they had all three of these things. They belonged to an organization, they were being paid for it, so they had economic opportunity, and they had a family. Uh, and so in many ways, ISIS was able to understand, the leadership of ISIS was able to understand this, and then key their, their, their use of social media and information to actually, uh, actually play on the wants and needs of these people and entice them to come into this, uh, this particular organization. And that was a level of sophistication that I think we were, uh, very, we were very challenged to, one, understand, and then second of all, respond to this. As you look at the uh, broader gray zone here, uh, and you look at actors like uh, Russia and China that are playing very significantly in this, I, I agree with the comments of, our, of, uh, of, my, of my fellow panelists here as they've talked about this. Uh, it is really important to understand what they are trying to do. Russia is you know, primarily focused on a disinformation campaign, trying to undermine uh, political institutions and legitimacy around the world. And they do a variety of things that are really, really focused on that, uh, to include attacking elections and undermining uh, uh, you know, the pinnacles of, uh, of democracy out there, trying to shape the environment, punishing people for taking action that is seen as, uh, as, uh, as supportive of that, and uh, trying to influence specific uh, outcomes. Uh, there's an excellent study out there done by the RAND Corporation that I would commend to all of you done in the last year or so uh, that really looks at this and, uh, and discusses these threats in, in much greater detail than I will at this, but I think it's an excellent way of doing this. When you look at the Chinese, I, again, there's, their approach is not the Russian approach. They are principally uh, much more, their information activities are much more focused on materially threatening uh, activities that are really designed to support their long-term plan, which is, you know, kind of the Chinese dream, the 2049, uh, economic prosperity and, and leading the world. And so you see the activities that they conduct are really, are really focused in, uh, in, that, uh, in that particular area. They're certainly not as robust as the Russians are, uh, but they certainly are, are looking for ways to do that. And they try to leverage uh, things that appear legitimate. Uh, and uh, and 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 try to bend and shape that narrative to support the the things that uh, that they do. So I think it's very important to understand what our what our what our potential adversaries or or maybe the better word is competitors uh, are doing out there as we as we look at this. I think from a U.S. standpoint, I think there are some things we ought to be thinking about here. Um, <clears throat> I you know a lot of us some of us grew up in in a time of the Cold War. And, uh, you know, we were, I think, very well organized to deal with the Cold War. We had an organization called the U.S. Information Agency uh, that orchestrated uh, kind of our information approach to uh, dealing with the Soviet Union. We lack that today. We've got a, uh, we have some, the startings of some entities with that, but it's certainly not as capable of doing that. And it's not in a position where it can orchestrate a national response uh, to how we deal with this. We need to get organized and we need to, we need to be thinking about this. Uh, we need to look at how we orchestrate uh, 
of both regional and global campaign plans out there. It strikes me as we look at what's happening in, in Hong Kong now, how we could potentially be using this as a way to address uh, Chinese aggression around the world and relying on our own values, uh, things that we have held, uh, held strong for a long period of time and using that as an opportunity to name and shame and to address aggression out there uh, and, 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 and compete in this particular environment. Uh, we should anticipate political meddling in our, in our elections and in other, uh, other aspects of our democracy out there and, and look at how we address and blunt those effects as, much, as best as we can in advance. And we need to be prepared to respond to fast-breaking information opportunities out there. Uh, our adversaries are actively working in this. Our competitors are actively working in this space. And we have to be prepared to deal with it very, very quickly to capitalize on these areas of gray zone overreach where we see the Chinese or the Russians uh, and perhaps some other actors out there, whether they're terrorist organizations, overreaching in this gray zone uh, competitive space here and, and address it very, very quickly. I think this is going to be a challenge for us in the future, and that's kind of why we posit, uh, posited this idea of a virtual caliphate out there that even though it, uh, you know, ISIS failed in their physical manifestations of a caliphate, uh, they've, they've, you know, we know how to address that pretty effectively. I'm, I'm less confident in our best ability to address this in, in cyberspace and in the information domain. I think this will be a challenge for us for the future. Gentlemen, thank you for some great insights. Let's give them a round of applause, please.